Good evening, everybody. Thank you for having me here tonight. And let me talk about uh, the three important aspects of Zen practice that my teacher and uh, the relevant tradition taught. We usually start uh, the Dharma talks with the mantra of the universe in its purity. But this time, we already chanted mantras here. And before I get to the point of the three important aspects of practice, let me draw our attention to one word, the dharani that we chanted after the Heart Sutra. Have you ever looked into that, what that really is, and how it's relevant to our Mahayana Zen practice? I studied a little bit of yoga, and one word in the eight steps of yoga practice kind of resonated with this. It's actually the sixth level. And to put that into context, let me just briefly recount the first five, the yama and the niyama, the do's and the don'ts of yoga practice, the pranayama and asana, the breathing exercises and the physical exercises. And fifth is pratyahara, where actually our practice would begin to be similar to the old Vedanta way when we turn the energy inwards. So literally it means departure from the attachment to the senses. That's Pratyahara, when we turn it inwards. And when that happens, then the mind has a single object, a single point of concentration, and that's Dharana. And so it happens that the object of this mind is Dharani. And usually this is a mantra that is truly important for the mind because it's the word that comes to being. Is it familiar? That's the way we define logos in the West. The word that comes to be or into existence. And the next one after dharana is jhana. And that's where our practice is from. Jhana, channa, chan, son, or zen. And the eighth is samadhi. Now with samadhi it begins to diverge again because the way Indians, Chinese, Koreans, and Japanese talk about, think about, and realize samadhi, that can be very, very different. Let's get back to this precious mantra or set of mantras that all have Indian ancient origins from even before Hinduism. And these are the Dharanis that remove disaster, that purify the mind, that remove obstacles, and it seems that they are so important that uh, every single Mahayana lineage kept them. So the great compassion Dharani, the Nilakanta Dharani, is found everywhere, from Indochina to Korea to China to Indonesia to Malaysia, Singapore, Hong Kong, Japan, everywhere you find it. And they chant it. And that was the first mantra 30 years ago that kind of convinced me by its effect without words, without human arguments, that this tradition is worthy of pursuing. Because if we do not pacify the mind, if we do not put these waves of the intellect and the emotions to rest, we cannot realize our true nature. If we follow our karmas of ups and downs, in other words, all dualities and opposites, we cannot attain our true nature. And that's how we get back to the original point of today's introductory talk. If we truly transcend ourselves, all dualities, all that came to being and subject to life and death, we attain our substance. Our substance has no name, no form, no life, no death. It has many names, but originally no name, no form, and no human thinking, which is most important. Why? Because we love to be smart about this. We love to put an kind of angle and understanding on it. But originally, this does not depend on our opinion, our standpoint, our tradition, our way of thinking, because all human thinking is irrelevant in this case. So when we return to this substance, we cut off all thinking. We return to the mind that does not know, does not differentiate, and what's most important, does not make I. And if we want to demonstrate that, we can do that in many ways, but one of them is this. So when you hear the sound, there is no thinking. 
For one moment, your narrative was cut off, your I did not exist. And if we go very deep into this experience, we can truly connect to each other, connect to this world, and attain our true nature, which is clear like space, clear like a mirror. But if we just stay there, this is insufficient. That's what we call the nirvana sickness, because people can fall in love with this. If you look at your own reaction to a very, very good set of meditation, it's sweet. It's somehow gratifying without anybody praising you or giving you good words. It's just a fantastic feeling when your energy purifies and there's a sense of oneness. I've seen monks who really practice hard on the mountains of Korea, three months in the winter, three months in the summer, the traditional 90-day retreats. And even in between, they do what they call Sanchol, which means the resting time on the mountain. So 49 days of retreat between the three-month retreats. There's not much time left for anything else. No time for teaching, no time for helping, maybe a little travel to friendly monks' temples. And if we stay on the mountain with this, then we cannot help the valley. The great vow of Shakyamuni himself and all the subsequent teachers and practitioners is wake up and save all beings from suffering. So if we don't teach and help all beings, then at best we have done 50%, even with the highest quality of clarity. So what comes after substance? How do we use this mirror? Well, we perceive truth. We start with what we see, what we hear, Hear that clearly, see that clearly. Then, what are you thinking right now? What do you feel right now? What are you doing right now? So this kind of awareness of the moment is the perception of truth. And with external sensations, it's fairly clear and obvious. But our own mind, our own unfinished karma, when you perceive that inside your own heart, your own soul, that's a tougher one. That's when we like to run away. That's when we like to put ourselves into entertainment mode or back to nirvana. No eyes, no ears, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind, no, 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 please, no. But after this, we say yes, because that yes will be correct. It will not be based on greed, anger, and ignorance. So what we perceive is the truth. What you see now, what you hear now, what you think and feel and act and say right now, that's it, because your mirror is clear. That's why we say that sugar is sweet, salt is salty. And the Bodhisattva has great sadness and great love, both. Compassion sometimes is translated as sadness, and both are very relevant. Because if you truly perceive the truth in this world, it's not something boisterous or elevating. We are really revolving in this cycle of life and death, billions of us, and most of us don't know why and can't make the best use of it. We just manifest our karma, bump into each other, live a few decades, and that's it. If we do not go to the third phase, which is function or action, then just attaining substance and perceiving truth, that's not complete. So the name of the third is, how do we help all beings? What is my correct function on this earth, right here, right now? And that fires the engines. That's when the jets go supersonic. Because this is the motivation why we live. Not for ourselves, but to manifest this clarity and actually help all beings become free from suffering. And if you look at the 10 ox herding pictures, it spells out exactly this, but in more steps. If we reduce it just to three, we are not missing that much, but we really lay down the important points. Attain substance, perceive truth, and perform correct action or function correctly. And there's not much else. The rest is just your karma that is manifesting personally, interpersonally, and socially. So if you look at it from this angle, 
We have a huge homework as a species, as a given society of East, West, North, or South, as families, as couples, and also as individuals. These are the four main karmic boxes, individual, dual or couple, family, and group, and also various types of groups. How do we use our roles in these environment? America is really based on the rights of the individual. The karma of the individual in this country is really clear cut. You have rights, you have liabilities, you have potentials, you have homework. So everything is focused on the self. And this becomes a much more complicated issue when uh, you get married and you have a family. And that's when everything changes. Further, the fourth step is society, how we take responsibility in our own habitat, in the neighborhood where we live, and in the state where we live, and in the country where we live. And that responsibility cannot be overemphasized. So how clear are we with our own roles in society, in the family, in a relationship? That depends on how clearly we attained our substance, how well we perceive truth, and how much ready we are to perform the right thing, to do our job and function correctly as a human being. So I'm glad that this Sangha here in Linkroft uh, practices regularly and comes back to this original point within your own tradition. And if you have any questions which I may help you with, this would be the best time to ask. I don't really fully understand what you mean by function, function correctly. When somebody is hungry, give that person food. When somebody is thirsty, give that person drink. So realizing what our job is moment to moment, that's functioning correctly. We human beings are really some smart kind of animal because we always want to know better. So. I see you're thirsty, but I still give you food because I believe that's better for you. That happens many times. I want to know better. I only use my brain, my intellect, my thinking, my logic, my systems. And I don't see your true situation. I don't see you as you are. I don't listen to you. So functioning correctly really requires the correct recognition of the situation, an appropriate relationship. And based on these two, we can function quite well. Okay. Other questions? Uh, the, the, there was the three. And the first was, you said substance. was substance. Truth, truth and function. Yeah, the truth and the function, I, I, I think I understand. But what the substance, what's the substance? The substance is... This, completely without thinking, we return to our Buddha nature. This is the practice we do in its purest form during meditation. Only without thinking, just like this is Buddha. This is a famous Zen line. So this substance is just a name on something that we cannot know or think or understand, but we can attain. And if we attain this, then we are completely free from any illusions, identifications, and false notions of self. In fact, that's the point when the water drop returns to the ocean and becomes the ocean. So without this substantial experience, our perception of the truth is distorted because the mind didn't become free from its karma. It keeps riding on its own waves. It still has self-image or images it still has ideas that it identifies with. It still has absolute values of good and bad. And that's why many times we could see in the last couple of thousand years that the road to hell was paved with good intention. And that's why we need to attain our substance, that our direction would be clear and our good intentions wouldn't lead us to hell. So this attainment is key. And that's why, especially in Zen, we put so much emphasis on practice, on attainment, not so much on thinking or theories. 
and that's how we can actually become genuine, true human beings. Because this attainment makes us humble. When you see both mind and karma as empty, this is termed the true repentance. This line is part of our temple rules. So attaining this emptiness, which is, I don't think, a good word. Emptiness is very misleading. The original term, shunyata, is empty completeness or complete emptiness. These two together, they give a better picture. Without the attainment of substance, nothing really works. That's why we have to dig deep and uh, humbly discard all delusions and return to our true nature. Not who we think we are, but what we truly are. And uh, in our tradition, the sixth patriarch, Hui Neng, was the first who really made a direct inquiry into this. Uh, as you may know his story, he was pursued by a very ambitious monk who wanted to take the Buddha's relics from him that were bestowed upon him by the fifth patriarch. He wasn't even a monk when he got transmission. He put the Buddha's robe and ball onto a rock and hit, hit himself. When his pursuer caught up with him, he tried to move the objects, but they seemed to have been fused with the rock. They became immovable. So then uh, this monk got really frightened and said, younger brother, I mean no harm to you. Please come forward. So Huinan comes along and the monk says, please teach me what did the fifth patriarch you know, give you besides these robes and ball? Huinang asked him, when you don't think of good and bad, what is your original face? Later on, it got kind of simplified into, what is your original face? And even simpler, what is this? So what is it that sees with your eyes, hears with your ears, feels with your heart, speaks with your mouth, and thinks with your mind? What is that? So attaining our substance is the answer to this question, because there is no answer which would be credible and complete with thinking or words in it. So having circumambulated this so many times, I say that it's a very blissful state when you know this and you act upon it correctly. Because everything else is just coating on it. You can put a Buddhist layer on it, a Christian layer on it, a Hindu and Advaita Vedanta layer on it. But this is the core. Okay. Other questions? I think you just said you didn't really like the term emptiness. So could you talk more about emptiness? Because we hear a lot about that in Buddhism. Yeah, when we just say emptiness, it's like a twin jet aircraft with one engine dysfunctioning. We only emphasize the lack of something. So on the one hand, it's true. So that one engine is working pretty well because we stop identifying with what we see here, taste, smell, touch, think no realm of eyes, any kind of consciousness. But what you attain, that completeness, is missing. And deliberately. But as scholars began to translate Buddhist scriptures, they were not practitioners. They couldn't put their angle of experience on it. So the academic translations, they were verbally correct. They were as per the dictionary. But you cannot really teach the Buddhist way or the Zen way without practicing it. And that's what we had to realize in the hard way. Because when people in the West began to contemplate this, some people became attached to this, and some people became nihilistic. They became depressed. They just totally misunderstood it because it was their thinking that interpreted it. And they took it as some absolute word, which was a completely wrong understanding. Everything you read, everything you contemplate, is just leading you to the edge of the experience. It's not the experience itself. Like, you don't eat the menu in a restaurant. You order your food based on the menu. Complete emptiness or empty completeness corrects that mistake, at least conceptually. There's less chance of a misunderstanding. In the first two, three years of my practice, I read the Heart Sutra every week with the folks in the Zendo. And I didn't understand it. My favorite part was the gate, gate, para gate, para sam gate, bodhisattva, because it, we were kind of happy about that. And uh, 
the rest was something that made me kind of quiet inside, but my logic had no grip on it, zero. Only after three years did I begin to understand the importance of doing it. Clear away all the obstacles, and then you can go through the gate of no thinking. How do you know that you took away all the obstacles, that you have no fear, especially not the fear of death? Now, if you look at those people who are thinking too much about emptiness, they have more and more fear, more and more aversion, more and more thinking, and they make more and more karma. Dry, cognitive, calculated karma based on the notion of emptiness. And that's the notion of it, not the experience or attainment of it. Zen Master Sung San used to say, if you only understand Zen, you lose everything. If you attain Zen, you get everything. Okay. Um, could you talk some more about attainment? I mean, after all, you hear that there's nothing to attain. There's nothing to attain, and I think uh, this is the cure for the ultimate human ambition. When you are in this room, you don't think about the distance between you and the Dharma room because you are here. So, as the sutra begins, Avalokiteshvara Bodhisattva, practicing deeply, or being in the state of transcendental wisdom, Prajnaparamita. Colon, and then comes the rest of the sutra. So when you are in the Dharma room, you don't have to go there, because you are there. When you practice the deep transcendental wisdom, there's nothing to attain, because you and this state of mind are not separate. And that's why I said that the water drop returns to the ocean and becomes the ocean. And of course, the next question could be then, what happens to the drop itself? Does it still know that it's a drop or it just got totally absorbed by the ocean? So deep inside, there is this question of annihilation or extinction. So if we extinguish the self, do we annihilate or not? The question at that time becomes irrelevant because there will be nothing to annihilate. How do we know this? Because the drops can also become separate from the ocean again. We can do that. You can see people with the highest attainment and yet they reform their own self. They formulate that again. Because we have the freedom to do that. But we also have the responsibility not to do that. <laughs> okay? <laughs> so, nothing to attain means everything is complete when you are in the state of prajnaparamita or transcendental wisdom. Reverse the equation. If something is missing, if you are not complete, if you are still kind of bitten by your own karma, then you're not in the state of transcendental wisdom. Then there's still something to be attained. Then liberation becomes a step away, a mile away, a mahakalpa away. Then we strive to get it. But the moment you get that, there's nothing to attain. And that's why it has to be spelled out, because imagine for some minds what it would mean that you would have this ultimate Buddhahood in the very end. There would be nothing to save us from our narcissistic trips. So no attainment with nothing to attain is the safe haven against the reformulation of an ego. And if we are there, we really stay one with the universe. The water drop stays in the ocean. That's it. We don't separate. In the Japanese tradition, there's a wonderful mantra by Haku Inzenji. This is something I may not quote exactly. The meaning in English is that never for one moment do we become separate from the mind of Kwan Seon Bosal or Kan Seon Bosatsu. And it's a fantastic mantra because this tells the water drop, stay in the ocean. Stay one. Do not separate. And then this nothing to attain becomes really wonderful. We all know that there are people out there that have unhealthy urges and are um, 
interested in stepping over what most people consider healthy boundaries. Would you talk about the non-self and dealing in that part of the real world? Yeah, please? don't stand in their way. So if there's a car going at 100 miles an hour on the freeway, don't stay in the same lane. Bear right. Let them act out their own karma and hit the wall without you being in between. And I know this is easier said than done because we work, we live, we have financial, political, social, and other lives. And many times uh, these people with unhealthy minds and no boundaries, they seem to harm us. And yet, we have to be able to become empty space. We have to be able to stay out of their way. Usually, when these people do not get enough attention, or they are alone, or they hit the wall by themselves, they begin to wake up. Unhealthy boundaries mean that uh, this imposition on other human beings or intrusion into their lives is painful. It's not welcome. Depriving the intruder from their gain means you're not in the house. Emptiness is a huge cure for this. And then their own hindrances, their own recklessness will become the teacher. So first, stay out of their way. Second, do not make any mistake. And the first mistake is a judgment. Because by your own judgment, you would be bound to them. You would start revolving around them. They would stop being just a speck of dust in the universe. They would become this huge black hole that swallow everything and everyone. And by your attention, you can make a small speck of dust into a trillion gigaton, megaton black hole. That's us. So stay clear. Don't make mistake. Don't be judgmental. Follow your own direction. Because their direction and yours, they're not the same. So eventually, they'll go beyond the horizon. Goodbye. When you were here last time, you brought a collection of 208 koans. And I haven't gotten past the first one, but I'm fascinated by it. I was wondering if you could say a few words about it. Yeah, which one was the first? Uh, where are you going? Oh, yeah. Buddha's, ancient Buddha's entered into like this. I don't know these kongans by heart, but the where are you going is actually clarifying our direction as a human being. Perhaps it starts with like this, ancient Buddhas enter like this, I also enter like this, you also enter like this. This suchness, or like this, in Sanskrit, tathata or bhuta tathata, this is central to Zen or Chan or Son. Because once you stop thinking in terms of dualities as absolute, so not, no absolute good or bad, only local values, then everything becomes just like this. The sky is just blue. This carpet is just beige, okay? So like this is suchness or thusness. When you leave the cycle of life and death or the samsaric revolution around the self, when the mind stops, everything becomes just like this, a reflection in a mirror. So this like this is what we enter. The Buddhas enter that mind. We enter that mind. And that's why the question, where are you going? Are you going around, around, around? Are you going straight? If you go straight, you do not repeat the vortices of our own samsaric cycles based on our own karma. So that's the kind of preamble to all the other kongans. Because if we really want to become free from life and death and not inflict suffering on this world, then we have to become free from our own thinking habits. Even the Buddhist thinking habits, ladies and gentlemen. And that's done by the paradoxes of the Kongans, because they really stop your mind. They are designed that way. That when you look at the Kongan, your intellect just stops. That's it. That's the first inkling of don't know. And if we keep that don't know, that don't know, that energy, that undifferentiated energy reaches critical mass. 
then your mind becomes clear like space, clear like a mirror. So this direction is supremely important. That's why it's the first Kongan, not the last. Uh, you made an analogy. I don't know. Not, maybe, perhaps not an analogy, but you mentioned uh, how uh, we as people have a tendency to move through life bumping into each other and manif manifesting karma and not mm -hmm. moving past that. Could you just talk about that a little more, what you meant by manifesting karma? This manifestation is centered around the reactionary mind. One simple thing, road rage. That's how this karma manifests. It's called anger. We have so much space on these freeways and highways. I'm amazed. I mean, your lanes are way wider than those lanes in Europe. So <laughs> that's amazing. We have these huge 16-wheeler trucks, and they need space. This uh, tremendous uh, explosion in some people's consciousness when others don't pay attention or they themselves do not pay attention, that's the manifestation of anger, karma on wheels, whether four, eight, or 16. Next is uh, desire manifestation. When you see these huge billboards, advertisements, or you see people even in restaurants glued on the screen, you can see in their eyes, they absorb everything. They believe everything. And whatever is on the screen totally formats their consciousness to the content of the screen. So mostly then desire appears because you bet that if there is a certain brand manifesting in that commercial, then the local mall will have an increase of 20 to 30 percent within the next two months. It's predictable. So that's the desire manifestation. You react to that. Okay, I need this, I want that, I, 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 I. So, two basic types of reaction, desire-based or anger-based. One is productive because it produces and requires products, okay? The other is destructive because it eliminates, it annihilates, all right? So, it seems that from everyone's point of view, a desire-based society is better than an anger-based society. Fair enough. It's much better to do commerce than wage war. But the equation is not so simple. There is a symmetry, an underlying relevance or connection between the amount of desire and the amount of anger in a given society. So if you have a high amount of desire, rest assured that underneath, when it flips, there's the same amount of anger. Because when this desire is thwarted or frustrated, it turns into anger like this, very quickly. If you look at powerful empires in Europe, in Asia, in Northern America, these empires have the same amount of anger and desire, but they manifest in different places. We believe we can control where we do commerce and where we wage war, but this is illusory. They interchange. Your wartime enemies became your trading partners. Look at the last 60 years. Trading partners in so many ways that the country which got two nukes in 1945, its spirituality is right here in this room. How did that happen? And I could go on. Europe is loaded with that. So let's be careful how we manifest this dualistic karma. And most of you have families, raised kids, or already grandmas. But you should know how much desire and how much anger can manifest in a family without destroying it. If it's too much, it's very destructive. Also, if it's too little, then everything becomes neutral. People stop talking to each other. There's just this eerie silence, which is very far from the noble, meditative, unmoving mind. In normal society, there's enough reaction not too little, not too much. Almost like a nuclear power plant. Enough heat, enough fission, enough cooling. Then there's electricity. Too much, Chernobyl. Too little, no energy, nothing. That's the way we live. So that's what we call the middle way. But if we cannot control this manifestation of the karma that you asked, then we are really the victim of our own habits and other people's habits. 
And that is not permissible. Why? Because we create those habits for ourselves and for each other. So how come that the creator, us, of this habit force that we call life and death on this earth would lose control? This loss of creativity, loss of control, loss of perception is called avidya, or not seeing, is the first step in the chain of dependent origination. It cannot be taken lightly. So the way this karma manifests depends on our own ignorance slash avidya. And if we have perception, seeing, or vidya, we can control this manifestation. If not, our own creation kills us. Our own karma controls us. This is very sad. But at the species level, this seems to be happening right now. And the way to get out of it is the way in. The infrastructure, society, everything that we created outside became so strong that for the individual it seems impenetrable. You would have to make such compromises, it would turn you into a human being you don't want to be. That's why the way out is the way in or inside. And that's when we can really change. That's when we can really transcend this karma. And that's why we are practicing. You mentioned dependent origination and was the first step. Uh, is, can you talk more about that? Yeah. I mean, when the Buddha talked about the Four Noble Truths, Lotus Sutra, he really laid out clearly the fact of suffering, the cause of suffering, the end of suffering, and the way to end suffering. And the cause of suffering, the second, is the 12 links in the chain of dependent origination. And the first is avidya, or not seeing. It's not just covering your mind's eyes, but separating your true nature from your own self-image. That separation is that you think you are something that you are not. So this false self-image is not seeing the truth. Believing in an image instead of attaining what you truly are. And then mental formations, then sanskaras or urges, and then there is the cycle of life and death because we are born. So if you look at the 12, the first three is barely understood. And I really suggest to practitioners that start with the first, avidya, how do you not see something right now? Or how do you become aware of something right now? Because you can grasp the beginning of all life and death, all your incarnations, right at this moment. Not in the past, not in the future, not in a projected present, an alternative reality. Right here, right now, as we are. Do you see or not? Is your mind clear, vidya, videre, video, same word? Or avidya, not clear, blind, covered, deluded? So that's the first step. So when you have opinions, projections, is the mental formations. Then you create an alternative reality instead of the truth. Then something else is born in your mind. We have many layers of delusions. Avalokiteshvara, or Kanzeon Bosatsu, is sometimes depicted with 16 heads above the real one. And I asked once, well, so why is 16 necessary? And I was given the answer that uh, we have so many layers of thinking, so many kinds of opinions, so many kinds of mental formations, that it takes so much compassion to turn to it as something created, something that doesn't exist by itself, and thus returning that karma to the source. So without compassion, it's impossible because the separation would seem infinite, eternal, and determined. And yet it isn't. So avidya is the start. Mental formations, opinions, dualities, sense realms, desire, then taking a body, then making karma with that body, running out of energy, dying, coming back up again, being born again. That's a tough one. And we've been doing that for many, many kalpas. And the good news is there's a way out. And the way out is that you take charge of this moment. 
starting with what do you see now? What do you hear now? What are you doing right now? So become aware moment to moment. Lose the avidya, lose the ignorance. Ignorance is not simply the lack of information. Yeah, at a very basic level it is. But ignorance is also too much information, too much thinking. When that thinking totally covers your mind mirror or breaks up your mind mirror, some heavy emotional reaction blows up your mind. The mirror is gone. You're in a state of shock. So this seeing, this perceiving, this vidya, this clarity is everything. We should never lose that. Sounds so simple. Am I seeing sometimes sort of, kind of, th these help? But it's not dependent on your glasses. I, I know. <laughs> your eyes depend on your glasses. Your mind doesn't. Go on. Uh, it seems to. Yeah. <laughs> you know. The if you talk about your visual consciousness, yes. But if you talk about this basic clarity, that doesn't depend on it. Okay. And yet, well, I'm human, right? It yeah, we like are. Oh, fortunately, we are. Can you imagine? <laughs> yes, we are human. So we are tied and bound to the senses, but we are not identical with it. I mean, the only question is, next time you drive home, which is soon for all of us, uh, can you undo your seatbelt when you reach your house front? And if yes, you don't depend on the car anymore. This practice also teaches us how to become free from the body. So once a week, twice a week, and if you practice at home maybe once a day, you remind yourself, you are the driver, you're not the car. And when this ride is over, bumpy or not, you have to release your seatbelt and get out of it. If not, we go to the junkyard with the car. It's not necessary. Your body goes to the cemetery. You don't. Other questions? Last week when I fell uh, on my face, broke my arm. <laughs> Sorry to hear that. One of the first things I said was, I don't want this and I said it with enormous passion and very human and I was thinking later on I'm not sure how Buddhist that was I have many reactions I'm really handle things like this pretty well on the whole but there's a sadness in me as well that I've tripped and that it's probably a sign of getting older which of course is a series of losses that are new to you as you're going through them um, any advice on negotiating such waters to tell you the truth, if it was up to broken bones, I would be 200 years old. Because until I turned 17, I broke toes, elbow, a little bit of the head, ankle, double tendon surgery. I can make a whole list. It doesn't depend on your age. It depends on the connection of body and mind. So when your awareness is gone, you are not in control of the body. And yes, it can happen over time when we get older, but it's not dependent on your age, it depends on your awareness. I was a hot-headed young fellow who played sports and kind of, you know, really hard. And I really lost control uh, of uh, my own movements. I wasn't violent, but I was intense. And that's why I broke several bones, you know, only in my body, not in anyone else's body. And I had to realize that this is a huge disconnect. I had too much fire energy. And uh, that disconnect had to be fixed. So when the body and the mind are completely one, and you are aware of both, at this moment, we call it a state of clarity. Your body is the hardware. Your mind is the software. Your awareness is the operator. And if the operator goes out, uh, for coffee, then the software can crash, the hardware can burn, i.e. if your awareness is gone, then your body and mind are not connected. And that's why it feels so integrated and precious when we sit, especially when we sit together. It's like a formation flight, okay? Several aircraft, same coordinates, totally parallel path, very orderly, but not stiff. So awareness is really everything. And if you want to meditate uh, on that particular karma which broke your awareness and thus the connection between body and mind, you can ask a question. 
First, in meditation, clear the mind of all the regular thinking, your shopping list, to-do list, do's and don'ts, etc. And when you have reached a state of reasonable clarity, recall the moment before you fell. So after you lost control and before the pain appears, there is a moment which seems infinite. You, you want to grasp it, but you can't. But you can go back to it and ask, what is this? Where does this come from? And that content of your subconscious, which manifested in this unruly, destructive way at that time, will become conscious. It will manifest itself. We call that the object-oriented question. What I mentioned earlier by the sixth patriarch, Hui Neng, what is this, or what am I, but I prefer what is this, is the subject-oriented question. It doesn't need an answer, at least not in any kind of name or form. But if your mind is clear, you can use it to find a particular relevant answer which was not conscious at that moment. So you go back to the moment of the trauma and you ask, what is this? Where does this come from? And both are necessary. And what's important is that your mind doesn't move at that time. It doesn't have anything that you desire or reject, an answer you look for or something you are afraid of. Because that would distort the mirror. Sooner or later, the answer will appear. There may be many answers that appear and disappear and don't touch that. It's your mind working. It's the noise that is cleared out. And if you keep the question with every breath, then there will be an answer which is softly associating with the question coming to you. And if you keep the question, the answer doesn't move. And it fits. It fits to a larger pattern. It fits to a matrix of cause and effect in a way like a piece of a puzzle that drops to the right place, thus making the picture complete. And we call that insight, insight into cause and effect. And I have just said the basic methodology how to do it. And this meditation practice, like all simple and clear techniques, it's a pretty good foundation for that. Thus, you can discover it, you can make it conscious, you can reintegrate that karma into your normal personality so that it wouldn't control you from the background, from beneath the level of your consciousness. And thus, you can make sure that it doesn't repeat again. So, ladies and gentlemen, I sincerely want to appreciate your generosity and openness to have me here tonight. I hope that from time to time we can meet again, share the Dharma again, and make a concerted effort to attain awakening and save all beings from suffering. Thank you very much.